Let's talk about RAM. Threadripper Pro 5000 is out and we did the review. We had a high expectations and AMD absolutely smashed those expectations, but I want to actually just talk about memory. That's all. Threadripper Pro 5000 memory. That's Look at that. My wood grain. Dozens of folks have come and gone building their own Threadripper Pro 3000 systems on our forum over the years, and Threadripper Pro 5000 is essentially the same with regard to memory compatibility and speed. A lot of lessons learned here. I see some folks wandering in about to make the same mistakes, so let's talk about it. <laughs> Threadripper Pro 5000 supports anything for memory, but I don't think you're setting yourself up for the best experience if you use regular desktop memory with Threadripper Pro. Yeah, I know. This isn't really a change over Threadripper Pro 3000, at least on paper. There are some practical positive changes over Threadripper Pro 3000 in the 5000 Pro series, but what I'm sharing are just my thoughts so far on Threadripper Pro 5000 and memory and also my experiences with memory on Threadripper Pro 3000 because I've been running the 32 and 64 core systems we use here in the, in the office. Threadripper Pro is an enterprise product, but AMD's kind of kept their options open and they've also qualified you know, consumer level memory, desktop memory, uh, is it, and it's pretty rare to have a CPU that can work with almost any type of DDR4 out there that's made. Technically, Intel briefly allowed this on their 7000 series CPUs on X299, uh, but then they pushed a microcode update uh, revoking the extreme memory capacity. But anyway, based on my experience and helping our forum users, if you want to run your insane Corsair Dominator Platinum memory at 3600 on your $4,000 Threadripper Pro CPU, uh, you can. I just don't think it's very wise. Uh, definitely not enterprise. Let me explain. All right, put aside thoughts of desktop memory for a second. Let's go over the three basic configurations of DDR4 memory and who the customers are for each config. Got some visual aids here. First, there are UDIMs. This is desktop memory. This comes in all shapes and sizes. This is sort of what they look like naked. Sometimes they have fancy stuff on there and there's all kinds of stuff and the specifications are all over the place. XMP and memory overclocking, that's way, way outside the base specifications. And while it might be okay in a desktop computer, a desktop motherboard configuration with, you know, two channels, maybe four channels, a CPU with eight memory channels, that's nah, less okay. Eight DIMMs running 24 seven with extreme overclocking, memory that wasn't designed to operate at those speeds, but just happens to do so at higher voltage or that the memory manufacturer has tuned, that's, that's asking a lot. Because of XMP and tuning, most memory buyers are used to buying memory in kits. You get a quad channel kit or a dual channel kit and it's 3600 or 4000 and the timings and everything all matches perfectly. But with server memory, there's not really memory kits. At least historically there hasn't been. There might be because cons consumers expect that now, but historically there hasn't been. You just get a part number and when you need more memory, you buy more of that part number and it'll work. And you just buy as many as you need. Before we move on from desktop memory, there are also error correcting desktop memory. And by the way, this is the only type of error correcting memory that can work with Ryzen desktop processors. There's nine chips on here. There's no extra chip or anything like that. This is unregistered error correcting system. Remember our AM4 system? This thing based around our ASRock X470 uh, D2U, D4U. This system supports error correction. It's, you know, not quite the same error correction as our uh, Monster Threadripper Pro system or any of our Epic systems, but uh, it supports up to 128 gigabytes of memory, but our Threadripper Pro system is two terabytes, holy moly. Two terabytes, 128 gigs, what, what's the difference? What's, what, what's going on? Well, the first big difference is registered versus unregistered, and we'll talk more about that. But the other thing that's missing from the AM4 platform in terms of error correction is that there's a system module that when an error occurs at a low level, the hardware logs that. And AM4 usually doesn't have a system management platform you can access, but this one does. But it still doesn't log it to the system management platform. It does log it to the Linux kernel, so you can DIY it, but the memory uh, control stuff on our plucky little AM4 system here 
uh, is a little different. It does fix single bit errors and it does detect two bit errors and it will report those to the operating system, but it doesn't do anything at like a board level. You could configure, you know, on a server, you could configure a watchdog, you could configure IPMI, you can do all sorts of other fancy things that happen outside the operating system on a server platform or even Threadripper Pro, but you can't really do that because those modules are missing on AM4. So that's desktop memory in an ECC and a non-ECC uh, configuration. Then there's registered error correcting memory. It's different from the ECC UDIMs that we just saw. <laughs> there's nine chips plus there's another chip in the middle. And this is, uh, well, okay, there's actually more types. There's subtypes of registered error correcting memory that are all enterprisey. Uh, there's load reduced DIMs and 3D stacked memory and we'll talk about all of that, but registered. What is registered? even mean it literally means that it has extra registers there's a bit of a buffer in the form of registers on the ram to handle buffering the address and control commands from the memory controller you see normally at least in the case of our io die the uh, th memory controller on the thread pro cpu sends commands to the memory and the memory will need some time for the signal to settle and be read properly uh, the circuit propagation time electrical connection through the physical memory connections. UDIMs don't really have this extra register on the memory to buffer what the memory uh, was supposed to be doing. And so it has to wait on the memory controller so it's a little bit of a two-way street. You can't just time it uh, exactly right. The, the, DIM, the memory controller has to acknowledge that the DIM has acknowledged. There's, there's a sort of a delay there and you can just, you know, it doesn't matter if you don't have a lot of memory though. And that's the case here. So it's like the task is addressing more memory. At the risk of oversimplifying, RDIMs reduce the electrical load and the logical load that the memory controller has to keep up with when it's managing and juggling tasks to fetch things from memory or write things to memory. In this case, the task is addressing more memory. Load reduced DIMs or LR DIMs have had worse latency and worse throughput than RDIMs, but they're designed to reduce the load on the memory controller. So, yeah, that's it's registered error correcting memory in a little bit. And then there's this idea of rank. A rank of memory is a whole extra set of chips. So I've got this, you can see there's two rows of chips on this one DIM and it's a double sided. So this is at least a dual rank DIM. And what does a rank mean? It's like, well, memory is arranged in rows and columns. So an extra rank in a memory stick like this can be addressed more or less independently, even on desktop memory. Sometimes you see benchmarks where more memory ranks is faster. And that's why, it's because they can kind of sort of operate independently. It's a little bit of extra load on the memory controller, but we'll call it independent. So the bus and control lines can be busy a larger percentage of the time. You can basically tell this row of memory to do something, and then when this row of memory acknowledges, you can tell the other row of memory to do something, and then check back with the first one to see if it's done. Then there's 3D stacked. So instead of having physical rows like this, which come with electrical and noise penalties and connection penalties, sometimes you might have two dims, and the ranks go uh, physically across two DIMs, even though you could have a rank on a single DIM, uh, 3D stack stacks the memory inside one package. So instead of having two physical rows, there's one physical row, but inside the chip, you actually have two physical rows of memory. And that actually improves the electrical interference and improves the noise ratio when running at higher speeds. Uh, it's, reduces the electrical load on the memory controller, but it doesn't really reduce the logical load since the ranks are still there with 3D stacked memory. Just multiple pieces of silicon per chip, which is actually really cool. Now, the Threader Pro platform supports two terabytes of memory. That's 256 gigabytes per DIM. That is an enormous electrical and logical load on the memory controller. 3D stacking is how you get to 256 gigabytes per DIM. And the largest companies in the world are basically buying all that up, all the best stuff that's, that's being made as fast as it can be made for their systems. You know, Fang, those companies. So to recap, when we're talking about server ECC memory, we really mean some type of registered memory. Registered memory, load reduced DIMs, 3D stack DIMs. LR DIMs offer middle densities and performance and 3D stacked offer the highest densities, but uh, the performance maybe is not as good until you take into account the fact that more independent ranks can go faster. Now in the past, I've tested load reduced DIMs and they're like 15% slower, but 3200 is kind of a new generation of LR DIMs. So 
Uh, now for this video, I tested the M. 393A4G40AB3, that's from Samsung, 32 gigabytes, and the MTA18SAF4G72PZ. Now those are those are both 32 gig DIMMs, and they're both DDR4-3200, so they're newer. Cautions here about <laughs> LR DIMMs being slower is really like 2666 and older if you're gonna try to do that. They both have a cast latency of 22, and I was kind of surprised because I was expecting the LR DIMM config uh, to be slower, but it was only about 7.5% slower, so things are improving than the RDIM. Everything else, uh, the other parameters were sort of close to being the same. LRDIM being a thing for a while, newer generation of LRDIM, okay, maybe it's not that much slower than uh, than uh, just a regular registered error correcting memory. It's faster than its older counterparts, at least for the speeds around 3200 for these specific parts. And these are JEDEC memory specifications too. The motherboard manufacturer doesn't set them. They're not stored in, you know, an XMP profile or, or anything like that. They're, you know, official specs. Theoretically speaking, pure RDIMs are going to be a little bit faster, but you're probably going to top out around 512 gigabytes of memory. If you're going to go for, you know, a terabyte of memory, you're going to be in that load reduced DIM, 3D stack DIM territory. So, I, but more ranks tends to be faster. So it's probably not worth really worrying about if you've got regular registered error correcting memory or load reduced DIMMs or 3D stacked DIMMs. As a practical matter, for 3200. Only 3D, 3D stacked is useful for the highest densities if you're gonna run you know, one or two terabytes. But this is really just a long-winded way of saying that even though you could theoretically run DDR4 3600 consumer DIMMs, don't. Our DIMMs are fast and they're cheap, relatively speaking, for up to about 512 gigabytes. And Historically, load reduced DIMMs have been slower, up to 15% slower, but not really much anymore. And, uh, uh, you know, 3D stacked is completely okay. Hey, stop that. I don't care about any of this. I just want to know do I need to populate all eight DIMMs? Well, that's very, you know, very astute of you. <sighs> This platform does have eight memory channels. It's one DIMM per channel. That's why this supports two terabytes, whereas an Epic CPU would support four terabytes. It'll support four DIMMs per channel. So four DIMMs and the this, this stacking in the ranks and everything is massive electrical load. One DIMM per channel. Would you populate all eight memory slots? I kind of would recommend that, but not super strongly. So Threadripper Pro 5000 supports in, in like best performance configurations four, six, or eight DIMMs. And eight DIMMs is definitely the fastest. More memory channels is, is more better. I mean, that's pretty easy to understand. The more memory you add, the more it's gonna evenly distribute things. And all of the memory IO goes through the IO die, so there you go. If you're thinking about leaving some slots empty so you can upgrade later, mixing memory is not really a good idea. You would order the same part numbers of the registered error correcting memory to do an upgrade later. You can mix memory, but I don't think it's as well tested as just having eight DIMMs of a matching set of memory. Every time I've tried to use mixed, you know, I've got a lot of old server memory, like 2666 and slower, and every time I've tried to mix that with something newer, it hasn't been a good experience. There's some posts on the level one forum that have had, you know, some similar experiences, but you could run four DIMMs with this, and that might be fine for the, you know, 24 or 32 core. If you're gonna run the 64 core CPU, definitely populate all eight DIMM slots. Your memory bandwidth is gonna thank you. You've got 64 cores. You really need the memory bandwidth to feed all of those cores for what you're running. Unless what you're running lives entirely in cache, then okay, maybe. But you probably wouldn't be watching this video because you already know what you're doing. That also pretty much means that the minimum that you would run on this platform is 128 gigabytes of memory, but 32 cores with 128 gigabytes of memory, what, it just, no, no. You could run some other platform. That's kind of a, the paradox that you get into. Okay, I'm gonna get a 24 core Threadripper Pro at 128 gigs of memory. It's like, well, are you buying that because you need the PCIe capacity? Because the next, next generation of desktop is gonna be out soon. And do you think the 16 core on the desktop with 128 gigs of memory is gonna be slower than the 24 core with older memory? Because I got news for you, the new platform in 16 cores is probably gonna be faster than the 24 core Threadripper Pro 5000 equivalent. So the reason you buy Threadripper Pro 5000 is 512 gigs of memory and lots of PCIe lanes. And if you don't need either one of those two things and lots and lots and lots of, lots of cores, see what I'm saying? I mean, yes, it's amazing. 
there's no, there is no competition for it on the market right now in terms of just raw performance. Uh, there's not a deal where you're going to save thousands of dollars and get close to the same performance, except those desktop class processors. And yeah, server memory is, is unglamorous, but that's probably a good thing. I'm not sure that I want RGB on my server memory. I want my server memory to be as stable as possible. I'm Wendell, this is level one. It's been a quick look, <laughs> quick look at uh, Threadripper Pro 5000 memory. Woo boy. All right, I'm signing out. You can find me in the level one forums.